I'll just open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are a God whom we cannot limit, Lord. You are a God who you will share your glory with no one. I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you, Lord, as we have heard today of the foolishness, the foolishness of preaching, the foolishness in the plans and the ways of our God to man seems completely foolish that he should send Paul to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews. But yet, Lord, in, in your wisdom, Father, is contained so many things that your power, Lord, as we heard, may be made known in weakness. Father, keep us humble, keep us on our faces. And I pray today, Lord, as your word continues to go forth, that you would speak to our hearts. We want to say, Lord, this afternoon, as young Samuel said, here am I. Here am I. Use me. We pray, Father, that that would be the cry of our hearts today. We don't want to run from you, Lord, fight with you, Lord. We know at the place of the cross is where we find true peace, true comfort. As you said to the Apostle Paul, how hard is it for you to kick against the pricks? Oh, Lord, I pray, just come into our midst this afternoon, Lord. Come amongst us in your grace, in your mercies. Lay us low, Father. Minister to our hearts, to the very hardest heart. You would come and melt today. We ask, Father, that you would grant us the unction and the anointing of your Holy Spirit, without which, Lord, these words will just be dead and empty today, without which, Lord, I will just stand and share from my own human flesh, and it will profit nobody, Lord. I pray, please, would you come and add great blessing to this word, and you would take this simple man, Lord, and bring glory to the name of Jesus. Touch every one of our lives today. Speak to every one of our hearts, I pray. We grant you the right as Lord and as God. And so I pray these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. The message is entitled this afternoon, Simple, My Son, Give Me Thine Heart. If we turn to Proverbs chapter 23, from where we find this verse, Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26. Simple words, but yet again profound. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. And so, Father, we just ask now, grant your blessing upon this time of fellowship. O oh, Heavenly Father, you are interested in us and we pray, Father, that you would minister. Grant us thy grace, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, these words have been the repetitive theme of my heart this week. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways and I know as well as you know how easy it is to get on board the treadmill of Christianity amidst the busyness of life going through the motions of Christianity and all that it entails and yet our hearts 
our hearts have wandered away from our Heavenly Father. Luke 8, 14, our Lord, in expounding that parable of the sower, said, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they had heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. If that doesn't sum up the society in which we find ourselves living in, I don't know what does. Lacking for nothing materially, but yet we've never been such a busy people, such a fretting people. Suicide rates, you know, through the roof. That which fell among the thorns are they which when they heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. The heart, as we know, is everything in a relationship. Without heart, there's no relationship. We can be married on paper, but what makes for a marriage? It's the heart. We can have children, but what makes for a loving family? The heart. The heart is everything in our relationship. If we have no heart, then we may have a relationship on paper, but we have no relationship in practice. And above everything else, Whatever you want to do in your Christian walk, the heart is everything. And so it's this that I want to challenge us today upon because it's this which makes a difference between life and the difference between death, the difference between just being a dead corpse and the difference from being alive in Christ Jesus. My son, give me thine heart and let thine wet eyes observe my ways. And so I want to ask from the onset this afternoon, where are our hearts this afternoon with God? That's the only question that I'm interested in this day. Where are our hearts this afternoon with God? And is our heart wholly given to God? And that word is crucial today, wholly given to God. Because you see, we can say, well, the Lord has a part And that should be the testimony, obviously, of every Christian that they're God-conscious and that the Lord has a place somewhere in their hearts. But I didn't ask that. I said, is your heart wholly given to God in completeness, in totality? When Jesus was asked, which is the first commandment of all, he didn't say to them, Thou shalt not. When Jesus was asked, which is the first commandment of all, he answered this. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now, I don't know what you would have said if the Lord would have asked, or rather if someone would have asked me that. Perhaps we would have quoted the first commandment. Maybe we might have quoted to them, Thou shalt not murder. Which is the greatest commandment? The scribe came asking our Lord, and he begins with the Shema, Deuteronomy Chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then he proceeds on from that to say, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, with all thy might, and with all thy strength. This is the first or the greatest commandment. Mark 12, verse 29 through to 30. Singleness of love, note, singleness of heart, singleness of soul, singleness of mind, singleness of strength. In other words, the Lord said that the greatest commandment is that we love God with our totality of being. Nothing else is worthy of the living God of heaven. Why did our Lord begin with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, For exactly that reason, one God should be the focus of all our hearts and our attention. That one God whom we serve. 
And we see in this passage before us a father exhorting a son. And he says to his son, my son, give me thine heart. Now, we understand as fathers that there's one thing that we would seek from our children, and really it's the battle that we face in our society today. With all the competing factors of television, social friends, the media, the internet, computer games, there's one thing that in the battle a father seeks, and it's simply for the heart of his son, for the heart of his children. And this is the battle that's raging in our society today. The hearts of the young ones have been taken from the hearts of their fathers and the hearts of their mothers. And they've been turned to foolishness, to computer games, and to everything else under the sun other than their parents. And we see society and families breaking down. Children in absolute rebellion against their parents. Why? Because their parents have not their heart. My son, give me thine heart. And we understand that to give someone your heart cannot be forced. The Lord cannot take us and pin us up a wall and force us to give him his heart, give, give, force us to give us his heart. He can't do that. It must come from the one whom he, who he is asking of it from. It must come from us. And he says, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Again, free will, let, let, let thine eyes observe my ways. And I believe that once our hearts are given over, it's the secret of the Christian life. Once your heart is given to God in completion, the rest just follows suit. The obedience just follows suit. Still have to make the choice to serve God, I'm not saying that. Still have to face battles and conflicts and wars and wrestlings both within and without. But I tell you something, when our hearts are on the altar for God and they're placed in Him alone, the rest just follows suit. But when our hearts are divided... When our hearts are not solely given unto him who is worthy, the Christian life becomes mighty difficult. Why? Because our priorities are divided. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and that one Lord requires our everything and our all, not to be divided nor to be shared out. And as I said, the reason why so many Christians are struggling in the area of obedience, and they are, it's because, as I said, they have a divided heart. Now, I want to ask a question because this message is not going to profit us anything unless we be honest. And I think that's the crucial thing in the Christian world, honesty before God. The Lord knows. We, we can't hide from him. We see even our first man, Adam, the first man, Adam, our first father, hid from God. When the Lord came walking in the garden, he hid himself. God already knew what he'd done. And God already knows the situation where we're in this afternoon, where our hearts are at. God knows. So we can't hide or pretend, but we would do well to get honest with God. There's freedom in honesty. But when we're not honest... We're just chained and bound. And so I want to ask a question. What has got your heart this afternoon? It's a simple question. What has your heart? Now to help you decide, because we know the stubbornness of man, we could say, well, it is the Lord. But we have to face the music as it were, or as Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. And so I guess, what do you think about most? would be a good starting point. What do you speak about most? Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so the mouth will always betray your heart, as it were. We want to know what's in our hearts. Listen to what comes out of our mouths. Another question that we could ask to help decide where our hearts are at with God this afternoon is simply this. What is your heart's attitude like towards the things of God and towards God himself? That's a good starting point. Let me put it like this. If we were to receive a call 
to come out for dinner, all expenses paid. No one would stop us. We'd be dressed. We'd be running out the house, thinking about it all day long. We're going out to dinner. Someone's taking us out to dinner. But at the same time, we know it's prayer meeting or we know that I need to get up and spend some time with the Lord and our hearts, uh, it's a chore, it's a burden, there's no joy there and it's just dry. And these are warning signs that we all face, every single one of us, because we understand as Christian humans, we're fluid, we're never static, we're fluid. And so I can have good weeks, I can have not so good weeks, I can have seasons where the Lord seems so near and seasons where something's amiss in my life. It's just how it works. But there's always sure signs, giveaways if you like, that are always trying to point and indicate one thing, where are our hearts at? And we can dress it with religious garb and play the Christian part. But we know deep down where our hearts are at with the Lord. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's it. What is the joy of your heart? That treasure is where your heart will be. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Give me thine heart And let thine eyes observe my ways. Jesus cried to Jerusalem, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. The whole of the Old Testament, I mean, there's people that say, you know, the the Bible's a fabrication. I don't know what people group would take a book that would claim is from God and write the worst possible history possible and then take, stand back and say, hmm, there's nothing in the word of God to bring any glory to the house of Israel. It's full of their failings. It's full of their wanderings away from God. It's, they stoned the prophets. They persecuted those that sent was sent to them, and then alas, they string the Son of God up on the cross. This is from God, believe you me, this book, and it contains in it Israel's continual wanderings, page after page after page after page. And you can open to any prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and you'll see the same picture. The prophets were calling back the people who had gone astray from God, Moses, no sooner than he'd led them out of Egypt, was calling the wayward people back unto God. And thus, the whole of the history of mankind just repeats itself. You say we're in the Christian era, it doesn't apply anymore. And I say it does, because the hearts of men are still the same. How often, Jesus said, would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wing, and ye would not. The Lord sought his people's hearts. Come under the safety of my wings. Come under the warmth and the shelter and the shadow of my protection. If we seen young chickens with their mother and the the comfort that they find, it's a place of resting and it's a place of trusting. Now, why did the Lord have need to tell his people this? Simple, because other lovers had her heart. Other lovers had her heart. In Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 27, God said to his people, Israel, I have seen thine adulteries and thy nayings, the lewdness of thy whoredom and thine abominations on the hills in the fields. The Lord saw his people's spiritual adultery and it's quite graphic. He said that they were like wild horses neighing after another lover committing whoredoms 
lewdness and abominations on the hills in the fields as they sacrificed to wooden objects of wood, of stone objects, idols that they've carved with their hands when the living God of heaven was not sufficient for them. And God took issue with his people. He said, I've seen your adulteries. And God reached out to his people and he called to his people Israel as he calls to us when we go a whoring after other gods. And in Psalm 81 and verses 11 through to 12, he said, but my people would not hearken to my voice. They would not hearken to my voice and Israel would have none of me. Tragic words. This is the love story of our God. I mean, I don't know about you. I wouldn't be writing these things. Just finish it, you know. You don't want to know, fine. <sighs> Off with the heads of all humanity. How can a living God, I mean, the Muslim that would read this would be repulsed. Their God's not like this. Allah, you mess with him. Off with your head. But we see the God of Israel saying that you didn't want me. I called to you. I stretched forth my hand to you to a people that were continually in rebellious and you didn't want me. And God says, so I gave them up unto their own hearts. And that's the reason why they didn't want him. God said, if you don't want me, and he let go of his people. And even in that, we know that it was just temporarily. You know, we're told in Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 that Israel, all Israel, shall indeed be saved. God said, I gave them up unto their own lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Let us turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. Please, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. And as we're reading these passages and these scriptures, let us not look at an ancient people two and a half thousand, three thousand years ago. But let us look today because it's the same God and the hearts of men haven't changed. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verses 6 through to 7a. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. We read here the following words. Thus, sorry, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? The Lord's asking Jeremiah this. It's like someone saying and calling your name, God saying, Have you seen what my people are up to? No, Lord. And the Lord continues she's gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree and there hath played the harlot and I said after she had done all these things turn thou unto me but she returned not the love and the mercy of God his children God likens unto harlotry. Now we all know what harlotry is in the natural. And to have a spouse that would be so treacherous to go and commit whoredoms. I don't know about you, but it just rents that marriage in two. And the trust and the betrayal. And yet this is what Israel had done to God. He was their God. And yet they turned and upon every high mountain and upon every and under every green tree that played the harlot, offering sacrifices, serving other gods of wood and stone. The Lord was not their lover anymore. And as I said, the mercy of God, he says, after she'd done all of that, the Lord still said, Turn thou unto me. That is just mercy. If ever I if ever mercy could be defined, after that, after she'd done all these things, God still said to her, turn thou unto me. The mercy of God. 
The book of James brings it up to current New Testament. James chapter 4 and verse 4. When the Lord, or rather James, cries out to a people, New Testament dispensation, lest we just think that everything we've read thus far is we relegate to the pages of the Old Testament. James says the same thing as the prophets of old said. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, he calls them ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, James talking to Christians, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Strong words, strong words. I'm just going to turn to James 4 because I'm going to read a few more verses. You ask, what was their sin? What was their sin that James could write so brashly, so harshly to a people? And the answers found in verses 1 through to 3, it was lust. It was covetousness. Are we not told that covetousness is idolatry? Why do you think that they worshipped the other gods? Because they sought from the other gods' hands. Let them provide us food. Let them be our supply. The whole issue of fertility rights and all the paganism is simply put the covetousness of man's heart. They want children, so they worship the fertility gods. And they want grain, and so they worship the fertility gods. They have a grievance with someone, they will worship the god that will bring vengeance on them. It's pure greed and pure covetousness. And we might not bow down to idols of wood and stone in our modern sophisticated world, but I tell you what, there's many idols that occupy the hearts of God's people. And it may not be a stone, but what has our heart is our God, ultimately. It is that that we're seeking to find gratification. It is that that we're seeking to find pleasure in other than God himself. And God says it's idolatry. James chapter 4 and verse 1, From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? They were just war machines, just full of lust, devouring one another, treading on one another, that they might find their fill and have their lust satisfied. James said, Ye lust and have not. You kill and desire to have. Now I'm sure they weren't killing with swords, but they killed with their words, they killed with their actions, they killed with their treachery, as they just stepped on one another to get what they want. You desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because you ask not. I find that amazing. Why hadn't they asked God? Because their hearts... We're not right with God. And so they were turning to other means to heap to themselves more lusts and material things. And God said, ye ask amiss. Or rather in verse 3, ye ask and receive not. So evidently there were some that had asked. But God, James said, you didn't receive because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. And then he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Jesus tells us in Luke 16 and verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And so you wonder why in our Christian walk there's times when we struggle, times when we can't seem to find the victory, times when obedience seems 
such a chore, such a battle, such a war. And I submit that these words of Jesus in Luke 16, 13 hold true. That a divided heart cannot serve God in any true capacity at all. There cannot be true love for the Lord whilst at the same time we have a love in our hearts for this world, for the things in it and the things that are perishing. Jesus said something has to give. You will either hold to one, despise the other. You can't serve God and at the same time serve the riches of this world. Friendship of the world, James tells us, is enmity with God. And 1 John chapter 2 defines for us what the world is. So we're left without any shadow of a doubt. In 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 through to 16, we read the following. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the covetousness, and the desire to have this itching flesh gratified by the things that we can heap to ourselves to please it. There's one that should meet all of our needs and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the issue. Why did God lead his people into the wilderness? That he might humble them, that he might see what was in their hearts. God could have led them into paradise. He could have led them into fields that were full of fruit and flesh, fresh flowing water. But we see the Lord led his people into the wilderness because he wanted to know what was in their hearts. And we see what was in their hearts. Give us water to drink. Give us food to eat. And when God didn't supply the exact thing that they sought, they turned their hearts to Molech and to the gods of the wicked heathen nations that maybe they might give them and meet the itch of their flesh. And nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, covetousness, and the pride of life. This is the world. And this is what the world lives for. But as Christians, we ought love the Lord above all things. And these very things ought be our sworn enemies that we don't want to make friends with them, that we crucify the flesh. James exhorts this backslidden people as he continues on in James chapter 4. Verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James offers these people who he has called adulteresses and adulteresses. They've broken their vow with God. They've proved unfaithful to their husband. Just like when we fall from God and we turn to give our hearts to that other than God, We commit spiritual adultery. That's what it is. May not be in a physical act, but spiritually we've taken our hearts, which ought be toward God, and we've put that love upon another thing. And that thing now has, or that person now has our object of our affection. They now are the source of our joy. They now bring us the pleasure which God alone should bring. And God says, that's adultery. You've been treacherous. You've turned your affections from me and put it upon another. But James encourages them and he tells them to submit themselves to God. He tells them to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Simply put, James says, come back to God. Let him again take that place in your heart. It's quite an easy thing to do. The conviction of God comes. You get convicted. 
He shows you what you're doing and you say, Lord, I don't want to continue on like this anymore. And so you say, Lord, I want to give you back my heart. And you don't say it with words alone, but you say it from the very depths of your heart and you mean it. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and he will, not maybe, he will draw nigh to you. Remember what I read earlier? Israel had gone a-whoring after idols and yet God still said to them, turn you from your ways and basically come back to me. The mercy of God. James tells them that they're to cleanse their hands, ye sinners, to put away that evil thing, whatever it is, to put it away and to purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And I want to focus on this last little part because this is what's been the thing that's been on my heart this week. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. Purity of heart. And James says, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. That word double-minded or that phrase means two-souled. I've said it many times, it means two-souled. It's when you're wavering between two opinions. It is, as I've been saying quite often now, it is when the children of Israel gathered there on Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, I said it last week, and Elijah said to the people, simply put, how long will ye halt between two opinions? Double-mindedness. If God be God, serve him. If Baal, serve him. But stop sitting on the fence. Get off and serve one or the other. This is what the Lord requires of us. If I am Lord, serve me and give me your heart. If not, then serve another master. But we can't sit on the friends. We'll serve God today, we'll serve idols another. The Lord wants all or nothing. And James tells them to purify their hearts. And if there's one thing we understand from the scriptures, and it's this, that God hates mixture. He hates mixture. There's an odd little law in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 19, amidst all the laws that are there, pertaining to morality, adultery, and all the list goes on. And yet we find this one thing buried in the midst of Leviticus. And it says the following, Ye shall keep my statutes. Ye shall keep my statutes. And then God goes on to say, Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. And you say to yourself, Lord, what's this doing amidst the laws? Is God bothered that they sow in their fields? Is he bothered that they should wear a garment of mixture? The Lord was seeking to teach Israel one thing, that he was holy, and that if they were going to serve him, it was not going to be with mixture. And this is the desperate need of of the church in this generation, with so many things to take our affection away from the Lord. This is the fight, this is the battle that every single one of us faces Purity of heart. Purity of heart. We see marriages breaking down. Why? Purity of heart. Their eyes are going a lusting and they're not content with the spouse that God has given to them. And we see adultery rife in our land. It's just a reflection of the heart condition of our nation. And the same is true in our Christian walk with God. Mixture is an abomination unto God. It's all or it's nothing. Purity of heart. James says, purify your hearts. And again, it's not a complicated thing. We just determine in our hearts that we're going to put away that thing which is robbing us from God. And we're going to give our Lord our everything. 
Is that your heart's cry this afternoon? That the Lord might be Lord of all. I've often been said he's Lord of all or he's Lord of nothing. I want to end with some encouragement. I want to end by talking about the love of God. As I've said already, they were adulterers, they were adulteresses, they were treacherous, they were unfaithful to their first love. And yet, as I said, God still says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to thee. I don't know about you, but I already said it earlier about in the natural. Your spouse, you know, the one you've loved, the one you've given everything to, that you should find, God forbid, than with another. There's nothing more abomination in a marriage than that. Treachery and adultery. And I don't know about you, but the Lord would have to work in our hearts to find forgiveness and to find reconciliation because that would be enough to kill a man. And yet we see, even though Israel had done this to God, even though they'd played the whore, God still said, come back. And the Lord still says the same to us today, come back. Even though whatever we've done, another has had our affection, God says, come back. Let me be the center of your affection. This is the love of God, the mercy of God. Now Hosea, we're all familiar with Hosea. He was told of God to actually go and marry a prostitute. The prophet Hosea was told by God to go and marry a prostitute, a treacherous woman, a woman who slept around with every man. Hosea was told of God, she's going to be your wife. And not only that, but you're going to father her children, three of them. I don't know how you would feel about that, but God was seeking through this to show his nation Israel what they were doing, that they had played the harlot, and yet still he loved them. Hosea chapter 1 and verses 2 through to 3. I'm just going to read a short bit of this. Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through to 3. We read in verse 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And we see later he gives... A daughter is born and then another son is also born. Now, believe it or not, I read that and it's perfectly natural, literal. Yet there's some that would say it's allegory. Jerome was one of them. And many other popular commentators, Keel does in his commentary, says it's allegory, it's fictitious. In other words, it's, it's God not really doing that, but using the picture of this, you know, um, to, to mirror the reality Jerome says, and objects to it being literal on the following grounds, it is a scandal to think of Hosea being commanded to take an unchaste wife and without any reluctance obeying the command. In other words, Jerome said it's unthinkable that God could ask a man to do that. It's unthinkable. And I flip it around and say it's unthinkable that the living God of heaven should do that with a people of flesh and blood. Forget the natural. What about the spiritual ramifications? Israel had gone a whore, a whoring in the presence of God, and yet we see God in his mercy calls his people back in their whoredom. Jerome objects. He says it's a scandal to think that a man could be asked to do such a thing. How much more a scandal that God in heaven, he should do such a thing. It most certainly is literal. It gets even worse. In chapter 3, Hosea is instructed to go and buy back his wife. He was going to have to go and purchase back 
his wife, who had played again the whore, again had gone into whoredoms and was found with another man, committed adultery against Hosea. Turn to chapter 3, verses 1 through to 3. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet love a woman, not only by her back, but I want you to love her. I want you to love her again. A woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and an half omer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days and thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. The same issue of harlotry that plagued Israel plagues the church today, make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, one God, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thine heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, with all thy might. Nothing less is required than that. Bring what commandments you want, what outward externals you want. Lay them all out before me and there's one thing that matters most, where's your heart? Because that's the issue and I know that that's the issue of me, that's the issue of you. And when the Lord comes knocking, he's seeking one thing, where's your heart? O backslider, return unto me. This is the mercy of God and the grace of our God. Is God calling anyone home here today, I wonder? Is God calling anyone home here today? Because if he is, know that he's a God of mercy, who is willing to receive you, to cleanse you of your filthiness, to wash you, to purge you, and to give you a right heart within him. He's willing, but the question is, are you? Are you? Because Christ said, How often I had sought to gather, but you would not, because your hearts were in love with another, and you didn't want to let it go. Going to finish, if we can just turn to Luke chapter 15, and then I'm going to finish. Luke chapter 15, and verse 11 through to 32. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And here we see the heart of a father. In verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But he was yet a great way off, 
But when, sorry, he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his oldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, What do these things mean? And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him, And he answering said to his father, Look, these many years do I serve you, neither transgressed I at at any time thy commandments, and yet you've never given me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son was come, which hath devoured your living with harlots, you've killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, you're ever with me. And all that I have is yours. It was meet, it was fitting that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This is the mercy of God. Draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto thee. This is the mercy of God. This is the mercy of our amazing God. I'm not even going to expound upon it. I think everything that we need is here. The question is, God is willing. This father was willing, but his son had to choose to come back. The father couldn't do that for him. The father ached when his son was away, no doubt, but he couldn't force the hand of his son. His son came to his own senses And knowing the mercy of his father, said, if I just go back, maybe I can find a place among the servants. While he was away, off his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran to meet him, put a ring on his finger, a robe on his back, killed the fatted calf. I'm going to have a feast because he who was lost is now found. This is the mercy of God. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, let us take heed what we've heard. I don't think it can be said any differently. It's what all the prophets said. You find it's quite monotonous. They all seem to be saying the same thing. Come back, O backslide in Israel. God is willing The question is, are you? Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, it's been a strong word, Lord. But at the same time, a word, Father, full of hope. That you stand, Lord, with open arms to receive whosoever, Lord. Oh, I pray, Father, that you might take first place in our hearts and lives. You might sit as king, enthroned on our hearts. Oh, Father God, I pray in this great war, this great battle for our hearts, there's so many competitors, Lord. We are mindful that you are one, Lord, and require our everything, our all. I pray, Father, that you would help us, that we would not go a whoring after the things of this world. As John warned the church, my little children, keep yourselves from idols. 
Oh, Father, there's some sins which are of such huge consequence, and adultery is one of them, Lord, to play the harlot does such great damage, Lord. But I thank you that there is hope of reconciliation. I pray, Father God, that we would seek your face today. I pray, God, that we would be honest with you today, Lord, and that we would make reconciliation. We would turn, Father, cleanse our hands, purify our hearts, and fix our mind and heart singularly upon you, Lord. Please aid us, God, in thy mercy. Aid us by the conviction of your Holy Spirit. I ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.